Okay, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Show. Today our subject is going to be on stress. I think uh, since we're kind of in the holiday season and throughout the year, 24-7, uh, <laughs> most of us experience some sort of stress. And some of us handle it better than others. Um, as defined, uh, stress is a reaction to any event that upsets the body's balance. Um, there is a famous psychiatrist, his name is Hans Selye, and I'm probably butchering that name, that ba basically stated that physiological stress was due to prolonged emotional stress. Majority of stress, other than pain or um, physical ailments, is due to emotional and how we react and our inabilities to resolve the stress. The most, uh, the things in our lives that occur that are most stressful in order of ranking, number one was death of a spouse, number two, divorce. So those top being around and more than 50%, well, we all experience eventually a death of somebody close in our family, be it a child or a spouse or a close family member and divorce or legal separation, those types of things. Very stressful events, but the list goes on and on. Pain, physical uh, ailments, moving, uh, getting married was the third, believe it or not, because of the adjustments. So all those trigger a res responses in the body. The physiological response in the body starts, ah, now here we go with the science. Uh, the pituitary in the brain releases a hormone called ACTH which then stimulates adrenals to convert cholesterol into cortisol. Cortisol is your fight or flight hormone along in conjunction with adrenaline so that you can be able to react to whatever would be deemed as a stressful situation. In the liver, uh, the cortisol stimulates the release of immediate sugar energy. So you know these women or men who lift the cars when their children are in accidents, things like that. They get tons amount of adrenaline and cortisol. It gives you almost super strength in some regards to deal with fight or flight. The problem and what happens is it short circuits the immune. So literally your muscles move better when you're under stress. They're stronger. Uh, one of the side effects, which can be bad or good, is the red blood cells also clot more easily, which can lend itself to other issues. So this is the immediate response that's given when we're under any type of, of stress in the short term. When you're talking about continual stress, ebay, that's where the problems come in and lie. They estimate about 80% of major illnesses are caused by stress or de-stress. Uh, 80%. So this is something you need to listen to very intently. And in our fi uh, fitness portion of the show, we're going to discuss some exercises that you can do to help relieve stress other than getting out there and doing the actual physical exercise. Um, normally, this stress hormone is broken down by time, sleep, or if you get out there and exercise, it releases this uh, cortisol buildup. Otherwise, this cortisol stays in the body and it's kind of like battery acid. It just goes through the vascular system and it goes shred, 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 literally. So very hard on the arterial walls, I know this is further down here, and really increases the risk of stroke because of clotting factors involved. When you're under stress, your blood goes thicken. And so keep that in mind when you're going through something extremely stressful is if you're already a high stroke risk, oh boy, this is going to increase it even more. Um, when we have continual release of cortisol, um, our glucose, you know, remember how I said in the, in the beginning that the liver will take sugar out of the, or the body will utilize uh, sugar out of the liver for immediate uh, fuel? Well, the problem with this is, is we find when sugar is released, just like when I told you you've got a teaspoon of sugar suppresses the immune system for four to six hours, well, you got sugar going in all the time, your immune system goes down, down. So what happens then is you get the release of a immune protein called interleukin-6, which contributes to uh, maladies such as diabetes, arthritis, cancer, osteoporosis, allergies, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, uh, headaches, memory loss. Oh, I have customers that will come in that are under high stress. Myself as well experience high stress with my kids um, and other, other factors. 
it affects your memory um, to where you can't remember certain things uh, at certain times and you're like I even had customers even question whether or not they may be getting Alzheimer's or dementia because they've been under extreme amounts of stress and all of a sudden they can't remember anything so panic not just recognizing this is excessive stress hormone can really affect memory um, Blood pressure rises, and we already talked about the cortisol just acting like battery acid on the vascular system, but that blood pressure, you get vasoconstriction, eh boy, and then you get blood clotting combined with that, you got a heart attack and, and uh, stroke risk that rises tremendously when you're under uh, continual amounts of stress. Um, stress over a prolonged period of time. Oh, affects so many different things in the body, but we see oftentimes when you're under a lot of stress that depression will set in, gastrointestinal issues. Um, you Virtually, when you're under lots of stress, stop producing or utilizing any enzymes for digestion because the body sees you're in stress mode. Okay. We don't need to eat when we're under extremes of stress. We need to run away from that tribes person that's attacking us. The point being is, is you're not going to break down your food, so you're going to end up with a lot of di uh, digestive issues as well. And you may think, oh my God, what's going on with me? Well, you're not digesting your food, so it'll go right through you or it'll constipate you, one or the other. Um, it also contributes to anxiety, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and phobias, continued amounts of stress. So if it's over and it's pounding on you, Generally, in a good portion of the cases, it's going to lead to one of these emotional maladies that arise because physiologically, the body will shut down with time. And certain hormones that we use to feel good, endorphins and other hormones, serotonin, are affected by extreme levels of stress. So, boom, working on the stress, we're going to talk about some of those ways we can relieve some of the stress or at least the physiological responses to the stress. Uh, nutritional defici deficiencies. Stress causes loss of electrolytes. It burns off tons of B vitamins. Magnesium levels. Magnesium re which relaxes the muscles, helps you have good bowel movement, lowers the blood pressure. Gone. It just is excreted by the body. Uh, your demand for certain types of vitamins, particularly B vitamins, rises tremendously when you're under physiological or emotional uh, uh, stress or distress. There was a study, a Dutch study done that discovered that people who were under prolonged stress had 50% of them had a, I'm sorry, all of them had at least a minimum of 50% reduction in immune antibodies to be able to react to things like uh, cancer, <laughs> flus, viruses, colds, name it. You just don't have it when you're under stress because once again, we talked about the sugar levels rising as well. Ah, there it goes. Your immune system drops, you can't fight anything off. So addressing this issue, we've defined it, brought out some of the symptoms and the results. So let's kind of address what we can do about it. And this is just like touching the, the tail on a kitty cat. This is just very little bits of information. But what I'm trying to encourage you to do is I'm going to give you some some information, you research it yourself um, uh, further and find what's appropriate for you and, and maybe some of these things will help you. Um, the diet. Okay. <sighs> Pop-tarts, Twinkies, and fast foods are not going to feed stress. Okay. The body requires enzyme-rich food because obviously if you're not producing any enzymes because you're under stress, you got to eat enzyme-rich food. And that would be um, primarily raw fruits and vegetables. You got to avoid the processed foods. The processed foods have no enzymes in them. They're going to sit in your gut and rot and then try to go through and the body's not going to be able to process them. The liver's under so much stress it can't um, get rid of the toxins produced by these. So. Ah, avoid those processed foods, go and seek the salads out, the carrots, the juicing, any of those kinds of things that you can do, uh, raw celery with peanut butter, to get yourself enzyme-rich foods. Grabbing that apple as you're, as you're walking from one office to the next. Avoid as much as possible caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, and mood-altering drugs. Now, there's a time and place for um, uh, medications um, that help with depression and anxiety. But if your depression and anxiety is a result of stress, 
in order to get rid of the depression and anxiety and whatever else that follows that, you got to work on stress. So looking at the diet, taking a real concrete look and examining what do I need to change and having the discipline and the love of yourself to make those changes. Get the regular exercise every day, whether it's walking the mission, whether it's playing soccer with your kids, whatever it is, you need to get regular exercise as much as you can. Weightlifting, dancing, and I'm talking every day, not this weekend Charlie business. Every day you need some form of exercise to release these stress hormones. Otherwise, they're going to stay in your body and they're going to cause damage. They're going to cause you to age tremendously. Because on the earlier page, huh, the sugars and, and stress hormones that are released, um, hmm. well, well, we'll talk about it a little further on when we talk about antioxidants, but it, it releases something called free radicals, which cause tons of cellular damage. They age you tremendously. That's why sometimes when you see people who've been, you haven't seen for a year or two, and you've seen them, and all of a sudden they look 10 years older, hi. That's why the, the amounts of stress just tremendously age and oxidize. It's kind of like your body's rusting in the inside. When we're talking about supplements, I've written a few here that are very well researched and uh, hopefully um, you'll see enough here to get some idea. Um, a good multiple vitamin with very high Bs. As a matter of fact, I take the good multiple, add some extra Bs like a B50 or a B100. We have a couple of physicians that do that in town like Dr. Lindbergh, Dr. Saunders, that put their high stress patients on B vitamins. They help the body deal with stress, stress of pain, stress of emotions. Those B vitamins are priority. Uh, I didn't write it on here, but when you're considering multis, a calcium magnesium supplement, a calcium citrate, Magnesium citrate supplement, not a carbonate, remember we talked about how poorly those are absorbed, um, can also help with replenishing the minerals from stress. So a good multi-mineral uh, would be very helpful as well. Antioxidant formula, including A, C, E, uh, selenium, zinc, there's other um, antioxidants, resveratrol, milk thistle, resveratrol, very well researched, green tea, very strong antioxidants for anti-aging because they are antioxidants. They'll neutralize the effects of these free radical things that try to age and, and kill you off. Um, as far as herbal is concerned, ashwagandha. A uh, Indian Ayurvedic herb, uh, 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams a day reduces fatigue during stress because usually when you're under a lot of stress, oh, you feel exhausted and tired. So if you can get the blood a little bit more alkali, get better um, diet going hand in hand. And then in our fitness portion, we'll talk about some breathing exercises and things you can do to relieve the stress. Exercising and then adding things like ashwagandha. American ginseng, Siberian ginseng that help with the stress recovery and memory. Chamomile, chamomile tea or chamomile um, capsules, natural relaxing agent that doesn't make you sleepy but it relaxes you. Uh, rhodiola, specifically feeds and helps with adrenal. The problem is the adrenal glands over a period of time because you, a person stresses them out because they've had continual stress. You get adrenal exhaustion or actually a complete and utter adrenal failure. Rhodiola, um, uh, things such as, um, uh, I have it on here, raw adrenal glandulars to help with those, the support of the adrenal glands. You can have a saliva test done that will mm, test whether or not you have adrenal exhaustion or adrenal failure. Talk to your doctor about that. Difficult to find a doctor that will run those kinds of tests, however, I have to warn you. Remember I told you when you're under stress, you don't produce any enzymes, it's like the food sits there and rots. Take some digestive enzymes when you're under stress, some probiotic acidophils to help you break down those foods. The enzymes are immediate. They digest that meal at that particular time. You don't have to wait for them to work. Uh, if you're having sleeping issues, we can do a combination of melatonin, theanine. Theanine helps take the brain out of a high stress beta wave pattern and make it up 
bump, bump, smooth alpha wave pattern so that you can fall asleep. I'm a real believer in theanine. I utilize it myself. Empty stomach, 100 to 200 milligrams before bed. You can also take it during the day. Um, melatonin, a natural substance that when you're under stress, the body stops producing. Because remember, you're in fight or flight. You're not supposed to be sleeping. So when you're in fight or flight mode, ah, very difficult to sleep oftentimes. So if we can do one to five milligrams of melatonin, particularly sublingual under the tongue, it can be a very helpful uh, with sleep. Staying asleep, getting to sleep, ah, good thing. Because if you don't get adequate amounts of sleep, guess what? The stress just gets worse. So those people who have insomnia and those types of things, it just amplifies the effects of the stress. Melora, uh, for those people who are hypertensive, high blood pressure, whose blood pressure rise, they're normal, but when they're under stress, their blood pressure goes boom. Relora um, has an ability to suppress cortisol stress hormones. So I have a firefighter, for example. She, when she takes her Relora, one or two of those twice a day, she has no high blood pressure. She goes off of it, she has high blood pressure. So that in combination with magnesium she does, she's gotten rid of most of her hypertensive high blood pressure and she feels a lot better. So Relora also, like I said, is a cortisol suppressor, so it also helps with uh, uh, the storage of fat that you sometimes get uh, with stress. Inacetol, panic attacks, OCD, all uh, can arise out of uh, inadequate amounts of inacetol. Taking 250 milligrams twice a day, can help with that. I've listed some other treatments on here. We're going to talk in our uh, fitness portion about meditation. But monitor your internal talk within yourself and try to talk yourself down a little bit. Huh, think in terms of what's actually really good in your life, what's happening. Try to maybe do a list if you've got lots of things happening, when to get things done. Huh, that internal talk can be problem and so you need to work on that whatever your spiritual beliefs are pursue a hobby and have some fun having fun is one of the best ways to get rid of stress so pick someone you like family member husband grandmother whatever it is go have some fun you release endorphins it takes your mind it distracts you from stress the body has a little bit of time to recover Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our um, show and I want to talk a little bit about some breathing and relaxation techniques Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show and this time our fitness portion is not going to be so much movement as the lack thereof. Um, when we're talking about de-stressing, um, there are certain remedies also that you can take in, in conjunction with relaxation. They're called Bach Flowers remedies and there's a little questionnaire that you can utilize and it works with emotional types of stresses and you can take it in conjunction with your meditation or throughout the day. What I would like you to do is I'd like you first of all to take three deep breaths just and then hold it for 10 seconds. Release it. Again. Release it. Try to breathe through the nose. Inhale again. Release it. What I've tried to do with doing that is that gives you some oxygenation to the brain. So whenever you're in a battle with your children, or a battle with your boss, or whoever else it be, if you can just get away for just one minute, because that took under a minute, and just do a little bit of deep breath, breathing, it oxygenates the blood, it brings the body back in balance. Now at home or at a lunch hour or wherever you choose, if you can find a comfortable place that you feel safe in, uh, where you won't be disturbed, 10 minutes a day, that's all it takes. This is an old uh, technique that's used by Buddhists for thousands of years and used by a lot of relaxation uh, psychologists or consultants to help their patients relax. And what they have you do is get in a comfortable position with your spine erect, sit as straight as you can. If you need to use a chair to support your spine, great. And basically what you do, you have your feet on the ground, you have your hands in your lap, however you choose to do it. There's different 
you know, whatever feels comfortable for you. And what you do is you close your eyes and you focus in on your breath. So just focusing on, and if you'd like to, you can say breathe in, breathe out. You can count your breaths as much as you can for at least 10 minutes. Just remaining still. Try not to move around a lot. Try to just empty your mind and not think of anything. And by focusing in on the breathing, trying to get you to not focus in on everything around you, the stress around you, just to turn the brain off for just a, a, a 10 minutes. I promise if you do this exercise every day, and I promise, you will be so much more relaxed and much more focused. Sitting simply, doing nothing, just focusing on breath. Breath that God gave us. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show with Ralph Turciano. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and I'm going to turn it over to our research analyst, Ralph Turciano. Thank Ralph? you. Well, our first part goes down to diet and pregnancy. Now, we all heard about the benefits of folic acid when it comes to help preventing birth defects. Well, it's a new substance out there that may not only help prevent birth defects, but at the same time, help prevent cancers during the child's entire life. It's a substance which is normally found in food, and its name is called choline. Now, out of the Boston University, a team of biologists had discovered that when animals were given choline and then a very powerful carcinogen which caused breast cancers, that the animals that had the most choline had all got cancer but had very slow tumor growth, meaning the body could either cure it on its own or basically be cured through other medical practices. In addition to that, the animals that had no choline had very fast-moving tumors in regards to this carcinogen. Something very important, and their words, quote, are said to provide additional support for the notion that choline is an important nutrient to be considered when dietary guidelines are developed, especially for pregnant women. Now we go back to antibiotics. We all know they're not really good for the digestion. They kind of mess with the gut floor, but we never really knew how bad or how strong. Well, in the Journal of Biology, forwarded by Stanford University, they looked at Cipro. And what they discovered was this. And now this is out of 5,600 different strains of bacteria. And these are among people. So this is a pretty intensive study. The study that found that while patients were undergoing treatment, the overall abundance of the good flora basically dropped by 30% as basically in regards to just damaging all the good bacteria which helps with digestion and general health. But here's the kicker. Remember this was with Cipro. The effects did not stop there. Once the course of treatment had been halted, it took up to four weeks for most strains of the gut bacteria to return just to pre-treatment levels. And then what was more disturbing than that, in a good portion of the patients, even six months later, some types of bacteria had not managed to return to pre-treatment levels at all. And they say the bacteria present in human gut are responsible for very aspects, various aspects of health, including metabolism, nutrition, and immune response. Just something to keep in mind. And now a final admission by the Food and Drug Administration. After all these years through a court battle, they now have to admit that mercury may show harm in regards to dental fillings to pregnant women or children that they now are recommending against the use of mercury or silver amalgam fillings or whatever they call them these days in people who are sensitive populations. The caveat to this is, you know, if you have a mercury or amalgam filling, unless you never plan to get pregnant, maybe it's something you should consider not having. Go one of the other alternatives. Basically, they also said too, that they're doing on studies, ongoing study, they started in 2002. For some unusual reason, the FDA has never finished it. But in response to that, the federal judge who ruled against the Food and Drug Administration forced him to warn people about this neurotoxin said, this was federal judge Ellen Siegel, this is your classic failure to act. So I hope this is the death knell for mercury fillings. It's something that should have been gone a long time ago. 
Now, what if people were gaining weight and it wasn't necessarily their fault? Another chemical that's a big exposure of our environment called tributylatin, which is a pollutant, which is often used as an anti-fouling agent for boats, wood, textile preservatives, and pesticides for high value food crops. What they discovered, that this chemical, tributylatin, the harmful effects on the liver and nervous and immune systems, of course, are well known. But they also discovered it caused people to gain weight like no tomorrow. The scientists said, they said in the December issue of Bioscience, the rise in obesity in humans over the past 40 years parallels the increased use of industrial chemicals over the same period. Iguchi and Katsu maintain that it's plausible and provocative to associate the obesity epidemic to chemical triggers present in the modern environment. Several other ubiquitous pollutants with strong biological effects include environmental estrogens, such as bisphenol A and non-phenol non, non have been shown to stimulate the growth of fat storage cells in animals. The role of tributylin and similar persistent pollutants may play a role in the obesity epidemic, which is now under scrutiny. Something to keep in mind for future use. Maybe it may not be a bad idea to go organic on your foods either. Now another one. How long ago has it been that the FDA said that antidepressants did not pass placental barriers and were safe for pregnant women to take? Well, now here comes a major death knell. Antidepressants, Prozac, and Paxil during the first three months of pregnancy. This is out of the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology. And this is after they excluded all genetic and cytogenic anomalies, meaning propensities and everything else like that. They discovered that when pregnant women took them, heart anomalies, anomalies I should say, rose dramatically. They were 4.47 times more likely in basically people taking Prozac and 2.66 times more likely in people taking Paxil, I say pregnant women. Birth weights were lower. Terminations of pregnancies were also increased, 7.8% for Paxil. I mean Prozac, 4.8% for Paxil, and 2.8% for the control group that was not taking it. If they were smoking, they were 5.4 times more likely with the antidepressants for having heart anomalies. The author said, quote, these findings clearly show a significant association between major heart anomalies and those taking Prozac and Paxil, says Professor Ornery. The one scary part about that is they ended it like this. They said many heart anomalies, the anomalies can now be treated. So they said you have to look at the health of the mother and the baby as well. So the recommendations weren't fully against it. They just said, well, if your baby's born with a heart anomaly, well, medical science to this point can take care of it just fine. Well, thank you very much. This was the end of our segment. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. I hope once again that the lecture on stress and Ralph's information helps you further research and want to find out how you can deal with stress and all these other issues that Ralph mentioned. Thank you very much for joining us.